Uh, welcome to our conversation for our ECNI 833 course on coding and makerspace. All right. And today we are very excited to have Mr. Brian Aspinall. He's an educator, a best selling author, and is considered one of the brightest STEM innovators in Canadian education. His book, Code Breaker 15 Ways to Get Started with Coding, continues to chop the charts in STEM education with a focus on rethinking assessment and evaluation. He was awarded the Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence for his work in coding and computational thinking. His enthusiasm, thought leadership, and approach to building capacity within STEM education has made him a sought-after speaker throughout North America. He has earned, that's also earned him the honor of being selected as Canada's first Minecraft, Microbit, and Makey Makey Ambassador. Welcome, Brian. My mom wrote that. No, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually... Hey. I, I don't it, know it flew off the tongue pretty easily. I kinda, <laughs> I, I've been very lucky uh, to actually meet you in person a couple times and to hear you speak and to have a couple of good conversations with you and do a presentation with you to some teachers in uh, Toronto back in the day there. So uh, good time. We've got a, hey, we have a whole Budapest blog series. Don't deny it. I still have that. Those are live and out there and everybody can go watch Dean and I traveling across Budapest if you want on Microsoft's dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exactly totally amazing. going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, Brian, that I'm Hungarian. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's awesome. funny. I'm looking forward to watching that. I'm very excited to get to meet you. And I would like to start with our first question. Do sure. you believe that being immersed in coding creates thinkers and learners that are fluent in mathematical thinking and learning? And is it an efficient way to learn math? Uh, the first part of the question, I will say yes, absolutely, 100%. 99% of the time, kids write code the first time through, it almost never works properly. And that's the moment innovation begins, when those kids begin to problem solve in that moment. And I think that also challenge us, challenges us to think uh, about our own pedagogy and beliefs around assessment and evaluation, because... By definition, traditionally, in, in many places, school is scored based on a quantity of correct answers. Where in the coding space, everything built on this narrative of it's probably not going to work the first time through and you're going to have a series of hurdles to complete this thing. But it's also intrinsically motivating. It's got that gaming factor that kids love and kids gravitate to. So they're, they're intrinsically motivated to want to get their program to work, whereas you know, and I shouldn't give a generalization, but you know, perhaps some students are not, are, are not intrinsically motivated to complete tasks that are done at school when they know that it's being scored, if you will. And, and math in particular, pardon my joke, math in particular shouldn't be evaluated as binary. Aha. It shouldn't be marked as, <laughs> as right or wrong. Um, and that I think is what creates the math anxiety we talk about or we read about so often these days, the math phobia, I do believe a lot of that stems from the grading narrative we have in place. In terms of immersing yourself in mathematics, like you had, you had mentioned or asked, I do believe that. I do believe that using um, a visual block-based learning environment allows kids by default to understand geometry without recognizing that they're doing school. And I'm talking about something just like Scratch. Not Python. I think that learning to code in a syntax-based language is less math-heavy than the visual editors, but I think it's important for our young people to get immersed in those visual editors because it also brings out the spatial awareness, which we know young people uh, with a strong spatial sense are going to be higher academics in math later in life and stronger thinkers and problem solvers. Absolutely, I agree. I'm, I'm new to the Minecraft world, so I'm looking forward to working with Dean on a couple of projects and learn more, but I totally see that many times the way we're being taught does not relate to our everyday life, so it's hard to see, especially geometry and in space, what's happening, so I, I do agree that that would be very beneficial. You know, we here in Ontario, we've got a new math uh, curriculum that came out this summer and has coding included into it. Uh, prior to this, I, I used to kid with my colleagues at school that, you know, in, in seventh grade, eighth grade here in Ontario, we talk about translating polygons across a grid system. Well, our, our, our grade two kids are now doing it in the scratch environment. And what happens when they come up to grade seven and the curriculum hasn't caught up, but they have mastered what it means to tile a plane because they've been doing it 
you know, in, in the Scratch environment or other spaces like Scratch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Right, sometimes you still get a pushback for going back to the basics, right? I know even Ontario too. I think sometimes you guys get a little extra pressure to, you know, know your times tables, kind of a thing. Yeah, everything in moderation, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, depending on what side of the debate you're on, you know, there's those that if you can Google the answer, stop asking the question, and there's those that root heavily on on a foundation of knowledge. And I mean. If you don't have a foundation of knowledge, you're not going to win. Who wants to be a millionaire? But the odds of me getting on that show are slim to none to begin with. So there you go. <laughs> well said. <laughs> okay, um, we'll move on to, to number two here. So does making mean making anything? And are there experiences or materials that are more valuable than others? I think your everyday household objects are things that kids should be tinkering with because um, it levels the playing field. You know, the equity piece we always talk about in schools is if kids have access to things at home they can tinker with, right down to like taking a part of VCR. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll back it up a little bit too. In my classroom, we used to have what's called Tinker Tuesdays, and that meant taking things apart under the same premise of we're always making stuff. Well, let's see how things work and, and dissect them as well. So to answer your question, I do believe that um, having kids make with everyday household items. I don't think there's one item that's more valuable than another. Um, I do believe that a, a heavy emphasis on unplugged making is incredibly important prior to including some of our new technology devices like a Makey Makey, for example. I mean, you can, you can integrate those two, right? I, I've seen projects where students were building cardboard arcades and cardboard pinball machines. And when they wanted to literally bring them to life with sounds and bells and whistles, that's when you can incorporate those technological devices if you've got access to them in school. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, just kind of, uh, I love the piece on, on um, like the equity piece because that is so important. And um, I think we really kind of highlighted that in like when we all shifted to um, remote learning and I know still parts of Canada are kind of still in that yeah. boat too. So, um, and especially right. like, like where I'm from too, is I, I teach in a rural division and like we have so many kids who have such limited access to, to tech and to, well, the tech is essentially, it's the easy part, right? It's the, like the internet connection and, and, um, those pieces that get a lot harder. My friend, my friend Chris Woods, Mr. Well-known Mr. Daily Stem, he talks about putting cardboard boxes in front of his kids and says, what is this? And they say, it's a box. And he says, no, it's a rocket ship. Go. And, and then 10 minutes later, they take apart the rocket ship and they say, now it's a, you know, a roller coaster. Go. Mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. It just starts with a box and everybody should be able to find a cardboard box here. here that was my favorite <laughs> Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. awesome. So, Brett, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing that, actually this question because we've talked in the past and stuff too, and, and you're doing such a you're such a game changer. Um, but when did you realize that coding had potential to change and impact student learning? I was in grade ten. It happened to me. Uh, this is in the early '90s. If you you got an hour, because <laughs> um, <laughs> for my, sure. In the, in the 90s, my father was a mortgage broker and was sick and tired of spending money on Yellow Page ads. And for those millennials out there who don't know what Yellow Pages are, I hate you because you're younger than me. But it was incredibly... <laughs> I know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's really expensive to advertise in the Yellow Pages, but that was the one constant found in every home, if you will, was a, 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 fellow, a telephone book. And uh, I remember him saying that if he could put his business online and, and build a website and put the website address on his vehicle, then as he goes to do groceries, he's always advertising when he's driving around town and how many people are looking in the back of the phone book versus how many people see his vehicle on the road. And I thought that was a, a really progressive approach because he was self-employed, right? So he started teaching himself HTML and I was fascinated by this idea of being able to change code and watch things happen on your, your giant 14 inch Pentium two computer <laughs> monitor. And uh, so I got obsessed with doing that. And I took a media studies class in grade 10. And the curriculum course was to cure research on a pop star, organize it, and present it back to the class. That was the media studies curriculum. And traditionally, that was done using poster board. And traditionally, you're all about my age, I would assume. Uh, researching back then meant cool, yeah. cutting pictures out of National Geographic and cutting pictures out of Seventeen and People magazine because that's all the, uh, the research we had. 
in a media studies class, so to speak. And uh, I pitched this idea of, of building a website instead. She didn't dictate the medium. We just had to curate the information and present it. Everybody naturally goes to Bristol board. That's just the way it's always been done. And I thought, here's an opportunity for me to take what I'm doing on my own and, uh, and turn it into a school project. And when I reflect on that as an educator now, the real value in that wasn't the building of the website. It was the risk the teacher took to allow me to learn to code as a byproduct of the process of curating information and presenting it back to the class. So that now when I think back was classroom differentiation, um, uh, scaffolding without intentionally doing that. So when I started to integrate code into my classroom, I found that the deeper I got with it, the more planning time, the more prep time I had back because it's just such a naturally differentiated sandbox that kids are going to create content to the best of their ability, their own ability to modify a program or photocopy a grade seven textbook for a grade eight student. It, I just, I, I wasn't doing those things anymore. So what I saw it do for some nonverbal learners, some students with autism, it just became a new way for them to communicate. And uh, I'm biased because computer science is my undergrad, but I have also seen what it's done for me personally, professionally, and what it really has done for some students in my grade seven and eight class who, you know, in Ontario, when you're in grade eight, that's your 10th year of elementary school from JK to grade eight. And to have parents say that, you know, it was the best year I'm not patting myself, but you know what I mean? It was the best year. It was super engaging like that. That was, that was the anecdotal evidence that we, we all heard. And it actually pushed us as a school to throw out grades. As a result of all of this, we went to a gradeless school system. We still had mark books because we had to do report cards, but we, we just stopped putting numbers on kids' work as a result. And we were getting less and less, um, what did I get? And more and more, can I try this? Because we removed the fear of failure. We preach risk-taking uh, and embracing failure because that's, these are skills industry demands, or, you know, quote, unquote, hey, but we work in a system in which failure is punished. I don't know a single kid that wants to take a risk because there's too much risk in not getting the grade. Awesome. That's powerful. So I'm, Brian, I'm, you were, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, so... I'm sorry, Dean. Go, Go ahead. Dean, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's it. I was just, I like that. So. <laughs> you were lucky to have a teacher like that to make it possible and help you out. But how can we help teachers to take the risk and incorporate more uh, maker space and coding into their classrooms today? Yeah, that, this, is, this is the tough part. And I get this question every day. And, and I teach higher ed as well. I'm a university instructor here in Ontario and I teach the tech courses. So these are very, very common questions, especially in my leadership classes. How, how do we push our colleagues? You know, if there's one person in a school doing these things, they're the weirdo out to lunch, right? And their door is closed. So how do we get to that 50% where everybody, the majority has their door open doing kinds of things? By default, I feel that coding gets lumped with math. And for whatever reason, that is one of the most intimidating subjects to teach. You know, I'm not a math person. We hear it all the time, which is a terrible thing to say because it sends a message that there are math people and there aren't math people. Um, so by, by default, I think we have to show people that it's, it's not an add-on because as you know, every time you go to another PDA, there's some new initiative and we're always talking about what are we taking off the plate because we keep, we keep seeming to just fill it until it topples over. The coding makerspace, I like to wrap that around project-based learning, which has a very less intimidating approach. And project-based learning can be unplugged, it can be low-tech, it can be high-tech. But when you say project-based learning to say a grade 10 history teacher, it's far less intimidating than saying, maybe you should try coding a historical timeline in your grade 10 history class. That, those other pieces can come down the road. And I also think that the more we focus on open-ended projects, inquiry is a huge thing in education these days. And if we're doing project-based learning, it's all going to be inquiry, assuming the projects are like authentic and beneficial to kids' communities and their own personal lives. Mm -hmm. But explaining to educators that the second you, you quote unquote, let go, if you will, of the reins and, and almost become that facilitator, the, the guide at the side, instead, what else, what's the cliche? Instead of stage the stage, on stage, yeah. yeah. And, and really let kids explore their own passions. 
Mm -hmm. I think the, the simplest example for me is, you know, when I was in high school, we all got the same novel to read, maybe Shakespeare, maybe not. And we all had to do book reports on it. And granted, I, I understand, you know, reading literature like that. But let's look at like a grade four classroom where if your expectations are simply to teach, read and summarize content and who gives a crap what they're reading. And the second you allow them to choose, and I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir out there that, you know, giving kids choice in what they read is just a no brainer these days. But that's how we parallel to project based learning and encourage educators that anybody can do this. And the more you do it, the more engaged your kids are going to be, the less planning you have. Like before I left the classroom and joined higher ed, I found I was doing at the end, I was like, I don't even know what I do anymore. Like I walk around and I talk to kids, but I'm not really planning. I know my curriculum well enough that I can pull it out of what they're doing rather than try and be a curriculum driver. We're always talking about covering, covering, covering curriculum rather than having kids uncover curriculum through project-based learning that might use coding and or makerspace. I really like that I'm writing that down, uncover the curriculum. Taking a master's class right now and um, uh, alongside the one that uh, this tech one that I'm doing, we it's all about uh, culturally responsive teaching, but just like working with the students, feeding off student interest, and like the R1 prof, she said, just massage the curriculum, just make it fit, right? Like you just kind of have to, just kind of have to, you know, whatever you're doing, there's going to be connections in the curriculum, so. Most curriculum has pretty broad uh, topics that you, you can make it work. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree 100%. You don't make the kid fit the system, you make the system fit the kid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, so this brings us into our, our next uh, question here. And so we have done quite a bit of talk on um, Seymour Papert and kind of uh, some of his work. Um, and so we're just curious, what is your definition of constructionism? Let's, let's back this up a little bit if we could, because yeah, uh, sure. I'm, I'm the biggest Seymour Papert fanboy on the planet. Um, reason being, you know, the unofficial godfather of educational technology, if you will, he was a mathematician first. And so when you talk about integrating code, he was using code to teach math. There's a big difference between the learn to code and the code to learn space. And I'm a big advocate for what Papert says in that when you're learning to code, the machine controls the child. But when you're coding to learn, the child controls the machine. And if you equate that to like a SAMR model, that redefinition is the ultimate place we want to get those kids headed to. So in terms of defining constructivism, constructivism whichever you know, C word you want to put on it, it's uh, today, <laughs> today it's synonymous with, with making and makerspace. You know, it's been around since the 1920s. It, the, the word itself as, as a philosophy of learning, if you will, has been around for, for almost a uh, hundred years, if not more. I mean, um, so, so to define it, I think um, I'm going to give it a, a 21st century spin maybe. And that's, um, providing those open-ended authentic experiences where kids are immersed in real world problems that relate to not only themselves, but their peers. You know, they want to help somebody in the community. They want to help whatever. And that involves making something, making an app, making a hat, making a sweater, like something, you know, creating, yeah. just creation. There, that's the best word, creation. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Like using something like the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations is a good place to start to, to generate brilliant. some thought for sure. Absolutely brilliant. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, those are, that's, I think, yeah, like you kind of said, um, I think sometimes we get held up by, you know, like those, those big, the big C where it's constructivism and constructionism, right? And I think it's important that uh, um, essentially, oh, yeah. It's giving like it's it's giving those students that student interest and giving them control and letting them explore and making new creation. I think you're exactly right. And and what's I mean, depending on who you talk to, some people will debate that those two words are not the same. They're different. They're some people will say they're synonymous. Whatever the case might be. In a nutshell, doesn't it just mean to allow kids to use their prior schema before they come to school to do what they do, like to relate to what they're going to be doing at school, mm -hmm. sort of in a nutshell. And that's just the authenticity of it, bringing school to life, life to school. Sounds good to me. 
it, it, Melinda, maybe you should ask the next question because I know it's sitting near and dear to your heart. More. Oh, for sure. So <laughs> I teach uh, English as an additional language, and I would like to hear from you. How do you see this uh, incorporated into English as an additional language uh, teaching? And uh, do you see it effective? And what are your thoughts regarding that? Uh, 100%. Reason being, whether whether you're teaching like English as a second language or just take teaching language arts here in our in our beautiful country I've noticed it's improved the word choice of my reluctant writers because they're be, they've been given a visual and so you're, you're almost bringing a graphic organizer to life you know when we teach kids to write a narrative we often give that reverse check mark uh, thing right like the yeah. climbing the climax the falling action well you bring that to life and if you I'm gonna just use scratch again because it's our everyday coding program these days but when kids are immersed in, in that space we get to hone in on their senses. And when we're teaching writing, we, we talk a lot about the senses. Like what are the main characters seeing, thinking, feeling, and how does that come through in kids' writing? Well, when you use coding, just like me in grade 10, the coding was the byproduct of the process of creating a presentation on a pop star. Using coding to create uh, an interactive graphic organizer is going to make kids writing better. I remember a student wrote, ah, that's a scary bat. And I mean, it sounds like a trivial example, but this was a grade six student on a heavily modified program down to about grade two. And the fact that he used the adjective scary was a win. And I said, what makes the bat scary? And he went, look at it. <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. Uh, that wouldn't have happened with a paper graphic organizer. I'm not saying graphic organizers don't have their place, but that wouldn't have happened for that student if he wasn't able to animate his own scary bat. Now, in terms of um, learning English as a second language, it's coding. Let's pick on Python, for example. Python here in Canada is the same Python in Florida and the same Python in Japan. So it's got this universal language to it. If we pick on the visual coding experiences like Scratch, you can still turn that into your own native language and the blocks will be in your own language and you can still create content. I'll, just an example here in Ontario, we have a, a low German population because we're so agricultural. And so we do have a lot of students where English is their second language. Well, they can program in Scratch using their own native tongue, but then have the cat say speech bubbles in English. So there's a nice transition from what they what they speak fluently in to what we're trying to to teach them while That's getting cool. all of the problem solving skills and everything else that we know that gets wrapped up whatever buzzword you want to put on it. <laughs> the well, I standards. really like the way you said it that it the graphic organizer that comes to life like I I love it. I I think that kids would really be interested in it. And if you are doing something that you love, then of course you want to do well, right? Like you said it. Thank you. That's why Minecraft is so awesome too, because you get the same experience with Minecraft when you start creating and building and, and doing those things too, I find anyways. I do too. Uh, so, so Brian, what do you think, uh, what do you think computational thinking, what effect does it have on society as a whole? How does it impact society? Those that embrace computational thinking, uh, I believe will have an edge over those who don't. And we're now in the big data era, right? We're in the internet of things era. Young people could give, our young people don't give a crap about privacy. They're willing to put themselves 100% online where my, the generation ahead of me uh, is very reluctant. You know, the, the odd Facebook post, maybe three Facebook posts a year. There's my generation that's kind of dabbling in the middle and then those below us who are full on, my phone number's in my bio. Uh, I remember reading a quote that said, if you're concerned with security, then this, this decade will do you a disservice versus those who are willing to embrace change in the big data environment. So I think similarly with computational thinking, if we define it as a means to solve a problem that might use code, very synonymous to the design thinking process, you start to recognize ways to make your life efficient using, you know, technology, whether it's programming, uh, Here's an example. I've got a buddy that also sells books. And every time a book sells, he's programmed Alexa to go cha-ching. And that's just fun. But every time he hears Alexa go cha-ching, he knows he's having a steak dinner. Little things like that, that will set like you have apart. Dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right? The little, little, little subtle, trivial examples like that will set people apart. 
who's willing to embrace it and, and, and use it to their advantage and who's going to be fearful of it and, and remain status quo. I saw a quote this week. Uh, Sunil Singh here in Ontario posted it. He said, if you're over 45 and you don't have a mentor under 30, look out because they think a lot differently than you do. And that really spoke volumes to me. That's a, um, that's whether we're talking computational thinking or not, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's one reason I love teaching so much too. The kids keep me young and current and, and I, <laughs> I learned so much from them. So I love that he said that. <laughs> They're your mentors, right? They're exactly. Mentors. <laughs> I learned so much, especially in Minecraft. They teach me all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've been coding with my class for 15 years. I'm still learning about Scratch every time I go and do a new workshop because it keeps evolving, keeps changing. Exactly. Um, so this brings us to our last uh, kind of question, and this is kind of just a, like a free-for-all for you. So I'm just curious, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Boy, yes, I would. <laughs> Uh, you folks, I believe, are doing a project on, on coding and makerspace, correct? Yeah. And I think we are ready to evolve. Um, what I mean is the hour of code was an amazing movement to mm -hmm. raise awareness. Mm -hmm. it's, it became something that was almost a checkbox, I believe. Mm -hmm. In my humble opinion, in a lot of classrooms, like, oh, yeah, hour of code, we yeah. did that. Yeah. I've heard, oh, yeah, scratch, we did that. Well, it's not a unit. You don't put the pencil away at the end of December and say we're using a pen for the rest of the year. It's the right tool for the job. So we need to recognize that computer science as a whole is, is software and hardware. And the software side is the coding stuff. The hardware side is the maker stuff. The, the meshing of the two is ultimately where we want the kids to be. I, I know how to code. I know what a makey makey can do. I'm gonna use my computational thinking skills to create something that's going to solve a problem um, for somebody else. So I think my, my, my message to anybody that might be listening is, is to, to take that next step. We're, we're, all, we're in the business of being lifelong learners. If you've dabbled with coding, phenomenal. Uh, if you're just at the learn to code stage, that's great too, but recognize that you want to get into the sandbox that is the code to learn space, but you also don't want to stop there. Physical computing is going to be incredibly, incredibly huge in the next, in this current decade. When we look at internet of things and big data being the 2020s, that means the next, the next cohort of entrepreneurs, let's go back to the 2000s. The, the, the successful cohorts of the 2000s were building software, like Microsoft Word and, and whatever. And then all of a sudden we get app stores and, and the entrepreneurs of the 2010s are building apps like Angry Birds or Airbnb or Uber. I think now in the big data internet of things era, the next round of entrepreneurs are going to be the inventors going back to constructionism that are going to use household items uh, to radically change the game. And I'll give you one quick example because I see that we have the free version of Zoom and we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I have it too. My, my wife and I own a couple of cottages that we rent on Lake Erie's North Shore on Airbnb. And somebody took it upon themselves to invent a door lock that I can open with my phone. So not only can I remotely lock and unlock my door in case there's a problem with our guests, the app actually logs how often that door lock was opened and closed. And that's data that I want to know. I want to know if people are hanging out inside. I want to know if people are hanging out outside because that's going to help us divine, define the space, interior space versus exterior space. But it also allows us to know when our cleaning crew has come. Now they bill us by the hour. And so if what they tell me they were there for, say two hours, doesn't jive with what the app is telling me in terms of often that door lock is open and closed, I've got a problem. That's a very simple example of computational thinking and internet of things. It's trivial, but a $300 door lock that connects to my phone has been a game changer for my Airbnb business. So I think little things like that are what we need to encourage our kids to be out of the box thinkers. We know that fire alarms now will text you if your house is on fire. We know that your stove will Snapchat you when the turkey's ready. Like that's today, you know, what does tomorrow look like? So. Oh, uh, awesome. what, okay, last piece, last piece. Thank you. No, this is awesome. 
the, the computing in the 70s, 80s, 90s was predominantly like offline Windows type machines. And then we had the internet hit and then websites became incredibly successful. eBay, right, in the mid to late 90s made a, a killing in the game. And then we saw the App Store and the App Store changed the way we do business because you, you wanted to be you wanted to have the best app in the app store. It's no different than being a TikTok celebrity. You want to be the best in that space. Well, these, these spaces are going to create new, new spaces, new funnels. Um, and TikTok's a great example because you, you get it from the app store, but it's now a space where you want to be the most popular in it. And I think that's going to be another evolution um, coming in the next decade. Mm -hmm. oh, that makes a ton of sense. This has been an amazing conversation, Brian. I knew uh, so. Thank you for uh, you know spending some of your time. I know you're a busy man and you got lots of things on the go, but uh, making some time for us today is very special. And uh, you hit so many amazing points. And I know that the rest of our class is going to benefit from this podcast and anybody else who has a good fortune to to listen to it. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for joining us. Uh, if you want to learn more about what Brian's work is, uh, check out brianaspinall.com or mraspinall.com and, uh, or follow him on Twitter. He's got an amazing Twitter uh, feed going at Mr. Aspinall. Uh, great stuff. Uh, he's got three books out there. Let's see if I can remember code breaker, uh, uh, Block another breaker. risk taker and then block Minecraft breaker. one, the Minecraft the one. one. That's, <laughs> and, I, and I had a metal block on it. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe was, that was on purpose to throw that joke in there. But, uh, <laughs> but hopefully, I know I learned lots. I hopefully everybody listening learned lots about coding in Makerspace. I, I know we did. And Melinda? And remember, you can think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. <laughs> ah, I love <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much.